Thank you uh, for pointing that out. Okay, so like I was saying, the homework one part will involve building a um, NumPy based convolutional neural network. Um, this you will implement a 1D CNN and, and a 2D CNN and a flattening layer, flattening layer. And then um, after that, you also going to be required to convert a linear scanning NLP uh, to a CNN. So you'll do that for linear and also you'll build a distributed um, you know, scanning NLP to do the same function as a CNN. And then once that is done, you're also going to implement a CNN model. So um, these are the directions that, um, these are the file structures that you're going to require for the homework. From homework one part one, you're going to be required to use the loss um, from the MyTorch folder, use the loss.py, activation.py, version.py, linear.py, and code.py. Um, however, the, the, the homework is not um, too much dependent on the batch number. So don't worry if you aren't able to finish this part of the homework one part one, but you do have to have finished the previous, um, the other file, the other parts where we've lost the activation and the linear the part to be able to um, use them for uh, this homework. And then um, we've added the homework two folder, which has the homework two, the files, MLP, so it's scan, uh, MLP scan, MLP, and uh, multiple choice. And then you also have the option of running the, the autograder locally on your computer through runner.py. And this other, the create table that you have to um, create your hand in files for autolab to grade. Um, also, the same instructions for um, installing NumPy and PyTorch. We reminded that um, the Autolab uses NumPy uh, 1.11 uh, for this homework, so ensure that some of the functions you're using are compatible with that uh, NumPy version. Okay, so, and then we also recommend that you really understand how to use reshape and transpose as this is going to be required uh, for when you're, you're, you're implementing um, your homework, especially for the CNN uh, models. Okay, so uh, we have a multiple choice questions uh, section. So this section is to help you understand the intuition uh, behind building CNN models and, and also understanding how the scanning NLP can be the CNN models. Um, this is also covered in the class and in last weekend's quiz. So if you really want to understand, if you still don't understand it, I suggest you go through the answers that uh, the quiz five um, uh, was provided. I believe this is provided on Canvas and um, try to understand how all these uh, questions, the answers come about, because that once you do that, it will um, greatly help you to um, finish up the homework quickly. Okay, um, so for the first part, we have the NumPy based um, convolutional neural network. Um, you're going to implement a 1D CNN and a 2D CNN. So we have provided you with the base code, which has a um, con.py uh, file, which is where you're going to implement the con 1D. So in the, in the con.1, Con.py file, we have a class, we have to implement a class, Con1D, which takes in the in channel, out channel, kernel size, and the stride. Um, this is almost uh, the same way that it is done in PyTorch. So we recommend going through the PyTorch documentation just to see, to understand how, what the parameters are um, and how to use them. Um, and then also note that you're not supposed to change the name of the attributes. So don't don't go changing like internal to other things. It would be good to be able to to um, use the variable names as as given. So you're going to implement the forward part, which now does the, the convolving um, through the input. Um, and uh, the pseudo code for doing this is already provided in the lecture slides. So I said I suggest I strongly suggest that you go through the lecture slides and implement the pseudo code as given um, um, 
Yeah, so I know there's a, a lot of for loops. Given, uh, you'd have to use an, uh, a number of for loops to be able to implement the convolution, but um, we suggest you try that first with the basic one. And then once, uh, once the, the for loops work, you can try to optimize by minimizing the number of for loops and using the priced functions to be able to um, do it maybe simpler, maybe in one for loop instead of three. Yeah, so the, you'll have the forward part. This the formula we've given uh, you to calculate the output size, and this was also provided in the in the lecture slides. And then um, these are the shapes of the input. So your input um, is going to be a size in channel and width, and then the output shape is going to be batch size of channel and output width. And then in the in the backward of the conv 1D, you're going to um, calculate the derivative of the weights and the derivative of the biases. The, 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 the pseudo code for this backward is also provided in the in the lecture slide. So Again, just go through the lecture slides and then implement the pseudocode as, as you see it. Um, the next, we also have um, conf, the conf2D. Um, this is, uh, the conf2D is now going to be um, scanning a 2D uh, input. So the intuition is the same, whereby um, only that the, the, the number of loops may change. So, Again, the pseudo code is given in the class, just in the class, in the lecture slides, just go through the lecture slides and um, you, you're going to be able to complete this section. Um, so in the, uh, in, in the initialization, you can use this to initialize your, your weights and bases, but it's not necessary uh, for this one, your code can still pass without doing the uh, initialization, but again, this is just a good initialization strategy that we suggest. Uh, then we also have the flattened layer. The flattened layer is uh, used in between the convolution layers and the linear layers when you are building your CNN model. So it's going to flatten all the, the CNN um, dimensions so that it can be able to uh, be used as input into the linear layer. This is a uh, code can be very simple and we've been given you um, a big uh, hints on how you can use this even um, through one line. Um, and then uh, we have the next section which is now converting a scanning MLP to, to CNN to CNN. So first uh, the first part is use, uh, converting the simple scanning MLP. Remember from the classes that um, have just uh, taken place that you can make a simple scanning MLP um, is actually uh, equivalent to a CNN model. So uh, we've given you uh, the input, the 128 by 24 input, uh, whereby the 128 is the time steps and the 24 is the dimensional for each time step. And then um, you're required to compute the results uh, of scanning it with a given MLP. So you're going to use the MLP, uh, the CNN as the MLP, um, and we've given you directions on how on how to do it. This is the structure of the MLP, of the MLP architecture. You have a flattened layer and a linear layer, a ReLU, linear, ReLU, and then a linear. And then um, you're going to use that and convert it to a CNN. So uh, for you to be able to do this, you need to, to be able to understand how a simple scanning MLP can be used as a neural network. And we had questions on this on the quiz. And we also have an appendix section which explains exactly how to um, convert the simple scanning to a CNN model. So we've been given the tasks um, here. Uh, just follow the tasks and add the layers. And then um, uh, remember to understand the reshaping and the transposing because you'd have to reshape um, the weights to the out channel, channel size and in channel, and then transpose back to the correct shape, um, which we have given you as out channel, in channel and channel size. Then um, uh, you're also going to uh, convert the same CNN to a distributed scanning MLP. Um, 
So again, uh, it's the same. Uh, it's the it's the same intuition whereby you'd have to um, define your 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 distributed scanning NLP and then um, make sure that it produces the same output as as it would a CNN uh, scanning model. Yeah. So this is an we've given you an example of how the distributed uh, scanning NLP architecture looks like, and then you just implement it. This is you're going to do it in the CNN distributed scanning NLP in MLP scan dot file. Again, the, we have the given you the tasks of how to, how to do it, and and remember reshaping and transposing. You need to understand that. But uh, if that is not very clear, there's a appendix section which um, gives you an example of how it walks you through how to to do that. Once you understand that, it's going to be very easy to um, to implement the scanning MLP. And then finally, we have uh, after having all these components, we have to build a CNN model. We've given you the architecture whereby you need uh, the uh, it uses this part uses the conv one D um, the conv one D uh, implementation you just built. So you'll have a, a, a conv channel and then a a conv layer and then a tan H activation, then a conv two layer and a redo and then conf, a conf layer, and then sigmoid, flatten, and linear. So in, in the previous web, I think you had the sigmoid activations. You may have to um, write up the tan H. Uh, I'm not sure if that was given, or, but I think it might, it might be there. Yeah. So you just initialize your, once everything is done in your sub, this part is quite easy to, to um, implement. You just uh, initialize your layers in the in the init function, and then you you calculate the output width of the final um, layer, and then just implement follow the steps as 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 given as given to you here, because these are all the things you have: the flatten layer, you have the um, the backward, you have the step function. It's going to be very similar in how same way how you did it with the um, MLP in homework one. Yeah, and then we've also provided pseudo codes for how to do this. So um, uh, that's it for the homework one, part one. On homework two, part one, if you do have any questions, I'm going to look through the chat if they haven't been answered already. And we suggest, because it's fairly simple, just once you understand the intuition, just post on Piazza if you're stuck. Um, but we uh, please do it as 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 soon as as you're able to start work on it. I think that ends my presentation. So uh, Shriti and Shairi will go on for the part two. Uh, yeah, I think somebody had a question on chat. Uh, Tushar. Mm. Backup pseudocode is not there for TDNN. Yeah, so for the TDNN is just once you understand how to convert the TDNN to the the CN the, the CNN, uh, which th that is the MLP scan, right? Um, once you understand how to do that on paper, then you just build it on code. There's no pseudocode, but it's it's uh, the same intuition for the CNN as 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 it is. So I don't know if you have maybe a specific question on that, uh, but the appendix section is going to help you. Just go through it. I suggest you go through it on paper. First, understand how um, the 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 TDNN does the the convolving, and then try to implement it in code. Uh, great. So we'll uh, start with the homework two presentation. Okay. Uh, so hi guys. Uh, for all of you in Pittsburgh, thank you for staying up so late and attending the boot camp. Uh, we'll walk you through uh, what has already been done, uh, I think, in recitation five by David. 
uh, we'll uh, go more in depth with the kind of architecture that you should be using for uh, the cl uh, phase classification and verification tasks based on the best state of the art papers. And uh, so let's dive right in. Okay, so probably I should. Uh, yeah, so, so the problem statement, you have been given two problems, right? One is that of classification, the other is of verification. So I hope uh, all of you have uh, gone through the write-up once, uh, since uh, like uh, that would be really helpful for us uh, while we walk you through this. Uh, so in the phase classification task, uh, if we speak of it. Yeah, so there are two kinds of uh, problems that you will see. So one is uh, the open set problem, the other is a closed set problem. So classification in itself is an open set problem. Now, uh, why is it so? So if you guys have looked at the data that we have given you in the train data, the validation data, and the test data, there are subfolders. And inside those subfolders, we have images. So the folder represents the class, uh, or so there are like 4,000 categories of people, and every folder is one person, and uh, the images are there inside uh, for that particular person. So if we have to test a model, uh, based on the training and the validation data that we have given in this format, then uh, if we have a face of a person which is not there in the train set or in the valid, I mean, in the train set, of course, then the model will not be able to classify as well. So that is why it's an open set problem. It is, uh, okay. So, oh, sorry, I mean, uh, it is a closed set problem. An open set is when you can generalize better to examples which the model did not see during training. And that's what we want, right? We want uh, the model to generalize well to new test cases, because at the end of the day, we want to make the phase verification model uh, as robust as possible. So uh, I will reiterate. So what I mean to say is, and what is the most important thing to note here is uh, this portion where so yeah, so this is the most important thing. The uh, difference. Shari, are here. you trying to like share your note? Okay, got it. Yeah, is the annotation visible? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so what I was saying is that in uh, classification, it is a closed set problem. A closed set problem is a model which does not learn to generalize well to examples uh, in the test set which it has never seen before. Classes in the test set, it has never seen before. So the model is basically trying to find a hyperplane and trying to separate the given classes. So I guess uh, some of you are familiar with something called uh, support vector machines, where if I have classes, and suppose these are different classes, so it tries to find a decision boundary and tries to maximize the decision boundary in between the two classes. So that is what basically a classification model would want to do. Um, but uh, talking of the verification part of the problem, we are trying to make the model as generalizable as possible. Now, how do we do that? So again, the most important part of this would be, change the color, okay, great. Yeah, so the model is basically trying not to separate the hyperplane as was here in this case, where the model was creating this decision boundary and trying to separate the classes. What it's trying to do here basically is, it's trying to uh, model the hyperplane in such a way that similar images in the hyperplane form clusters and dissimilar images uh, are moved away from that cluster. So let's say we have these red uh, dots here. I will try annotating again. Okay, so let's say we have these red dots here. So I guess if you are familiar with the concept of K nearest neighbors, so there'll be clusters formed if they are of the same class. And then, so if the cross is one class and the circle 
the red circles are another class. So it will try to form these clusters and that is how it will model the hyperplane. What we don't want is for this wrong class to be placed here or for our red class to be here. So this is what the verification uh, does during the training part of it. So uh, how many of you are like uh, getting the difference between verification and classification? Uh, can I have some yeses, noes? Okay. So I can see five yeses. What about the others? Okay, great, great. Okay, great. Okay, so probably I'll clear this, clear, clear, clear. Can I? Um, okay, so now uh, we would uh, want to go on to the next part. Um, I have to clear, it's not clearing the screen, which is weird. Um, Shruti, could you help me with this? I don't know. I yeah, I cleared it. I cleared it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, dive into the portion where we will talk about the problem of vanishing gradients. Now, for the ve phase verification or the phase classification task, what we want to introduce you to, like you have done in homework one part two, what you have seen that most of the times the model performs well when we are adding deeper and deeper layers as we kind of go into the network. So you see a deeper layer sometimes works better than a shallow network, as professors also mentioned in class. It's better. Uh, it is able to better approximate the decision boundary with the number of nonlinear layers we keep stacking than a shallow network. Now comes the problem of vanishing gradients. So uh, you guys are familiar with the softmax activation functions, the ReLU activation functions and other than edge and other activation functions that are used. So what happens is when we forward propagate and then we want to backward propagate the gradients using the chain rule, what happens is you are multiplying. Uh, so if this is my uh, say, we have, um, so if uh, this is my input layer and say there is a black box, there's a huge network, things are going on. And then this is my output and I want to back propagate my gradients to each of the inputs. What will happen is due to the chain rule in between the gradients, if it depends upon the initialization of course of the neurons in each of those layers that it might, if the initialization is really small, then uh, when we try to back propagate the gradients, the multiplication due to the chain rule makes the whole multiplication smaller and smaller and smaller such that you would see that even if your network is becoming more deep, you're not learning anything. It would be same as that of a shallow network. Uh, especially happens because of uh, sigmoids, why we, we have stopped using sigmoids at all, because it's like, uh, if you guys have done the homework one part one, you would know that when we calculate the derivative sigmoid, it becomes really small compared to that of a ReLU, which is one. Um, so in order to avoid or in order to do away with this vanishing gradient problem, and as you can, guys can see in this graph, that if uh, we have, uh, so we have the training error with 56 layers and we have the training error with uh, 20 layers and we see that with 20 layers in itself, a less deep network is able to decrease the training error much better than a 56 layer. So what do we do? We include something called residual networks. So what does residual networks do? Let's see. Okay. Um, what residual networks do is uh, in case that we want a deep network, but we want to back propagate the gradients at the same time, uh, let's consider X uh, is uh, the feature map and we are wanting to get X out of the feature map as well. Why do we want that? Because sometimes the network is over learning. So, and also we want the gradient to back propagate as well. So do, we don't want any activation or anything inside this, suppose, Let, let's just consider that. In order to do that, what is harder for the model to learn is an identity function. 
So if you have layers in between and we are trying to get rid of these layers because they are causing the gradients to go really low, what we want is the input X and we want the output to also be X. Now it becomes very difficult for the model to learn identity functions uh, or the weights to be like identity, to learn that identity. So in order to avoid that, what we can do, we can use something very simple. We can just take this network and plug it into the output of the layers and hope that what will happen is now the now suppose the, these layers learn a function f of x and we have x which we have concatenated with uh, f of x. We hope that if this portion of the network is over learning or it is uh, causing the gradients not to flow back, then we can basically learn f of x equal to zero, which would be same as this model inside learning identity. Okay. So this is the concept of ResNet. So when you backpropagate, you will always see that even if this is a uh, small X derivative with respect to X will always be one. So that's how we can help away with the problem of vanishing gradients. Now, uh, ResNets have uh, various kinds of uh, models that have been built over the years. Some ResNets have 18, 34 to even 101 layers, which are doing not as well, probably 50 layer networks also do as well as 101 layers. Uh, whenever you will find uh, uh, like the PyTorch version of the code of ResNet, the official code, you would see that there are blocks which are called basic blocks, bottleneck blocks. And then there, the model architecture is calling the basic blocks or the bottleneck, blo uh, the bottleneck blocks. Uh, so, we will uh, specifically discuss uh, the 34 layer right now. So what you can see here is, so this is uh, the input, uh, the, the output size that we want. So the model inputs 112, 112 input. And then uh, we are doing an operation which you guys have seen in the lecture called max pool, where we are halving the height and width. And that is how we are going so we are going deep into the network that way. We are max pooling, max pooling, max pooling. Now between max pooling, a lot of things are happening. So let's look at ResNet 34, the first one. Here, you can see that the network passes through two conf layers. The kernel size is three cross three. The number of filters that we have is 34. And we don't have one, but we have three such subsets. So you have three cross three, 64, two of them and then you multiply them by three. So we stack three of these blocks together. Again, similarly, we have uh, same kernel size, the channels increase, and we have four such subsets of the two of these filters. What you guys will notice that the feature map it, uh, it, it, uh, the, the, the depth of the feature map that increases. So we have 64, 128, 256, 512. And basically we are, we have one block, then we have another block, we have another block and we have another block. So let's say we are talking about this part of the network. So I will try and annotate. Okay, let's see. So this is what I was talking about. So you see this is into three and uh, this is into four, this is into six, and this is into three again. So what the codes try to do is instead of, so you, you can totally like feel free to uh, apply uh, resonance of any number of layers as you wish. But, and what you can do is basically you, when you're writing the layers, you can write conv D1, conv D2, and then you can pass the X's to all the convnets in this fashion. So you can just write it the way it is, but there is a simpler way of uh, writing the code because what you are doing essentially here is you are repeating the layers one after the other. So if I write one block and if I pass the network to three of these similar blocks, it would be same as writing all of them and passing the exit through each of them. And one interesting thing we see is these skip connections that I was talking about. So these skip connections are the X's over here that I am learning. And what this does is when we are trying to back propagate in case these are making the gradients too small, 
this basically would return a one. So this gradient would directly get passed over and so on and so forth. Okay. So I will just uh, tell you like very briefly of this portion of the network. How do we get this? Um, okay, so I'll just go to the other side. Yeah. So this is the first block that we see. Let's consider we had an input of 5656 and we have 64 channels. Uh, so initially your input would be an RGB. So it would be three channels. Then you'll have a filter, which will have three channels as well, 64 of those filters. And probably from 112, 112, three, you're getting 56, 56, 64, okay? So once you're getting this, what we just discussed was, we are going to pass it through a convolutional array, three cross three, 64, and we're gonna get the output. Here you will notice that the height and the width, they remain the same. Uh, so we are using something called, you guys would know, same padding, where the input and the output have the same, uh, the feature map has the same size. It retains the same size. Probably later on, the depth of the feature map might vary. So this is what is happening. So this is just the first part. So what do we have to do? We have to create uh, two such blocks, right? Because we are taking the input, we are passing it to two such blocks. And we also are very interestingly passing the identity in, and this is our output. So like you can see here, this is what we have created right now. But we don't have to create one of these. We have to create three of these as per the architecture tells us. So this is this should give you an idea. So we have two of the filters. We have the input. Again, we have the filters. We have the skip connection, the, uh, the filters, and the skip connection. And finally, this is the output that we get. And surprisingly, what we see is once we apply the residual network, uh, you will see that the training, uh, so the optimization becomes much better because the gradient flow is much better. You're getting the advantage of using a deep network. And at the same time, you are not facing the problem of vanishing gradients. So a deeper layer would essentially mean you would get better uh, error uh, decrees, better accuracy. Uh, so, um, guys, any doubts in the slide so far, please, uh, like, give me yeses or noes according to uh, what you've understood so far. If, if all everything's good, just give me a yes. Um, I have a question. Okay. So, why, I don't understand why you need several repeating um, groups of uh, layers. Uh, okay, so so uh, the model architectures that are built in the SOTA, they are all like empirical results that we have at this point of time. So we can't really argue as to why we are repeating the blocks again and again. It has been found that this architecture works well on a large number of uh, image data sets so far. So it's more of an empirical reasoning than like I would point out and tell you why this is happening. Of course, what you can do is you can take any of the repeating layers yourself and you can uh, take any target neuron and you can basically uh, visualize back what the neurons receptive field is learning. That way you would understand how the network is learning, not exactly why the architecture is this way, okay? Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Yes, I have one more question. Because I remember in one of the recitation, the TA said we can use batch normalization to uh, solve the problem of the gradient vanishing. So these two methods can work together or we can only use one or not? Uh, no, 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 definitely. You can use batch normalize. You, sh you can use batch normalization. Apart from batch normalization, when layers get deeper as well, batch normalization also starts helping the network which is why you need identity units so that you can back propagate. Okay. So it is like, uh, for example, uh, yeah, yeah, it is one of the tricks. Like uh, for regularization, there are so many things that we can apply, right? Uh, for uh, vanishing gradients or exploding gradients, we do initializations. So initialization is important, adding residual connections because images understand better if you are not just creating that identity and helping in the backflow of gradients, but if you are inputting uh, the uh, something from the input feature map again and again, it learns better. So there are a lot of reasons why ResNets work that as well. 
I see. So I have one more question. So um, do we need to build a network with more than 20 layers in the homework too? Because, because okay. the residue network looks like we need to have a very deep network, like 30 right. layers, so 50 layers. 18 layers is not as big as the 34 layers. So if you uh, will see the network with 18 layers, suppose. So this is basically this block twice, uh, each of the blocks twice, 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 which would give you an 18 layer network. And the way I will just uh, briefly tell you in the recitation notebook, so we will briefly see the recitation notebook code where you can understand how you can do this very simply. You don't have to like write every uh, convnet by hand and keep passing it through the forward. You can avoid that. It is suggested that you use a network which would be resonant 18 or resonant 34 but, and uh, do hyperparameter tunings uh, to the network to achieve the cutoffs. Uh, we will be releasing the baseline architecture tomorrow as well for you guys. So that should help you reach a B cutoff at least. It is suggested okay. that you use ResNet. You are free to use SphereFace and other architectures as well, which are mentioned in the write up. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, sure. Any other questions, guys? So are the 60, like, for example, the 34 layer one, uh, for the 64, 128, 256, are these the number of filters? All right, absolutely. So you see, this is the height and width here. These are the height and widths, which are decreasing using max pool. And uh, so let me just quickly tell you. Okay, so yeah. So, um, can you guys see my annotation? Okay, yeah. So this is suppose 56 cross 56. So what is happening over the network? Suppose these have, this has, uh, sorry for the horrible drawing. So this has a depth of three. What we are doing as we are going deeper into the network, this height and width is decreasing. So suppose it becomes 28, 28 and the number of channels are increasing. The number of filters are increasing. So these are basically the number of filters. So you're absolutely right to say that these are nothing but the filters. So uh, your depth of the feature map is basically increasing. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Right, okay. Any other questions? Uh, do people use dropout layer with ConfNet? Uh, with ConfNet like in general? Yeah. Uh, dropout general. used to work uh, well uh, before. Uh, not really as much. So, so it depends upon the kind of input that you have. I would be very careful. Um, for images, dropouts nowadays empirically don't work as well as um, probably tricks like other, other kinds of stuff like um, either you have identity functions or um, yeah. So uh, other kinds of regularizations would help better than just using a ResNet. I mean, Got sorry, just using a dropout, yeah. So, so in dropout, uh, definitely, I would say like it is basically a learning uh, sub networks, right? Many kinds of sub networks in the same network, but uh, empirically it doesn't work as well for images. So, uh, yeah. So it's suggested that probably for this uh, architecture when you create it, you don't necessarily have to use dropout layers. Makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So I will uh, quickly share, um, um, I'll stop sharing and I will just quickly walk you guys through the code. I think there's a question on chat. I don't know if that was addressed. Yeah, can you, can you, can you tell me what's the question? Just... Yeah, so um, Jenny is asking, can you explain why we need uh, identity function again? Uh, yeah, sure. Just give me a second. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, so why do we need an identity function? Uh, what we want to do is, okay, let's, let, let's go back to the slides, okay? And I will share my screen. Yeah. So why are we using the identity function? Well, because 
this portion of the network we are considering is causing a problem in the flow of the gradient backward. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to, so this network has already been created. We are not creating a small network. We are keeping the network as it is. Uh, what we are trying to do is having had the deep network, we are trying to take an advantage of the learnings of the deep network without causing a problem in the gradient flow backwards. So what I want to do is basically, suppose this is causing a problem. So I probably want to negate it, get it down to a zero. How I could do that, I could make this learn something called an identity mapping. So your input is X, your output is also X. And this network learns that given X, these deep layers here should learn how to output X itself. But it has been seen that the network learning for these layers for an input X and to get the output X is extremely difficult, which is surprising, right? So that's why uh, we, we have this function f of X and we have this skip connection, which is basically X itself, where we add it in here. So this function is free to learn what it does in case the gradients go too low, too bad, then this will become zero, but my gradients will flow back through X now, which is basically my something like an, an identity that you would use in PyTorch. So and you would um, see. I have a, I have a follow-up question. So sure. is, yeah, is it like a proxy just to make sure that the gradients are not zero? Yeah, good, good interpretation. It is also, also one, one thing is, uh, since it's not, so this is one of the ways you can curb the vanishing gradient problems, which is why ResNets are known so well. But I would mm -hmm. also mention that given an input image, and you're going like really deep into the network. So you're going deep into the network. So this particular portion of the network, these neurons, suppose we have like filters here, let's say this is a con filter. This con filter learns well when you keep adding a feature map from a few layers before it. So this is also one of the reasons why we prefer using ResNet yeah but like so uh, in the forward you would not only be learning the the deep layers but you would have a connection which you can add through the identity from the previous input feature map as well and in the backward what that is doing to me is it's not only helping me with the flow of the gradients but yeah basically curbing vanishing gradient problems so is there any particular reason why we are uh, using uh, the identity function so we could have used X square also, we could have used X cube also. No, I mean, basically what you want to do is, I mean, the, the goal is that X given the input should have X as output. So what you want to do is these layers are learning, but in the backward, they are contributing to almost nothing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so you want to, basically create an identity out of the that particular feature map to the next feature map you are seeing that using using these particular so why wouldn't you use an x square because uh like in convolution suppose if this is my feature map if we go deep we are pa basically passing filters through it and then we are hoping that it gets a better representation of x itself right we are not trying to change the input function in itself. Why would we want to do that, right? When you have, for example, if you have an image of a cat mm -hmm. with the pixel values, why would I do X square and make that network learn X square? I would want it to learn X properly, right? Now in the network, sometimes what happens is when I'm trying to learn X properly, I cannot because I'm not getting that feedback back through back propagation which is why I would use something like an identity function to uh, give me that gradient back to me. Okay. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I think, got it. Thank you. Oh, okay. so, so the weights uh, that are within, um, that are shown here, that are um, like sort of skipped over by the identity function, does it mean they will like they will go to zero and then they will not help anymore. Uh, that may happen, they, that may not happen. The intention is if they do not contribute then probably the network would learn to go to zero. But 
uh, it might not. Since the network's learning in between these layers, as I mentioned, that learning the identity mapping is difficult. So uh, it, is, it is free to learn nothing as well in those layers after a point that it stops contributing to the gradients. Yeah. I mean, in the forward bars, def so, so the gradients will get stored in these layers, will get stored in these layers, good enough if they are able to pass it back to the forward layer. If not, then this identity function is there to help. So these are basically your uh, the conf layers that you can keep adding. And then suppose suddenly you see that, oh, wow, now the network has become like, uh, so suddenly you see your training error was going down and suddenly it got up. So what you would do, you would do something like an error pruning. So an error pruning can also be done using the identity function where you're allowing the flow of the gradients backward so that, you know, you don't increase your error as well at any point of time or the deep network stops helping. So your accuracy basically gets saturated instead of going up. Okay. Uh, yes, Danish. Um, so I, I've got a question about um, how ResNets would um, work if you were to keep adding more and more layers. So mm -hmm. um, from the post that Diksha um, shared about overfitting, um, so the way I understand it is that if you increase the number of layers, uh, the capacity of the network also increases, right? And that makes it prone to overfitting. So mm -hmm. would, would it be safe to say that the advantage of um, putting more ReDU layers, sorry, not ReDU, um, ResNet layers um, would be that um, even if we go beyond um, what would be the optimal capacity of the network, um, the hope is that ResNet is just able to learn an identity and the layer does nothing. Yeah, that's right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The point of calling it an identity or like adding that identity is that probably it would learn nothing after uh, like a few epochs redundantly. So probably we can just help the gradients flow back and still make the network learn a little more. Yeah. Um, any other questions? There is one question on chat. Mm -hmm. can, can you just tell me what's the question? I can feel the effect of ResNet on gradient vanishing. How does it deal with gradient explosion? Uh, for gradient explosion, well, uh, ResNets won't help as much. You would do initializations so that that does not happen. So initializations like Xavier or Uniform based on the layer that you have created would help you resolve the problem of exploding gradients. Because of course, just like vanishing gradients, we have solved it using ResNet, exploding gradients would not be. So yeah, you can definitely use um, parameter initialization in your weight layers to do away with that problem. And many times you will see, like if you guys are doing projects or something like that, that suddenly uh, the gradient value, it goes to NAN. So that means that your initialization definitely has gone wrong, that the network is uh, blowing up. So yeah, that's that's an important thing to keep in mind, especially, yeah, in your projects. Sure. Any other questions? Mm, uh, is it? Okay, cool. Um, I, I'll quickly run through the notebook now. So, uh, so I think David has uh, walked you guys through uh, the data loader, uh, the image folder. You guys know that the image, why are we using the image folder? How many of you guys are clear with using image folders and everything? Then I wouldn't go through that. Yeses, noes, please. Uh, okay, great, cool. Then we will move on to directly what the residual block is doing, okay? So here we have the MNIST data set that we have. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, there is one person who is not clear about uh, how to load image through image folder. So if you could like briefly explain. Okay, uh, just a sec, I'm sorry. Alexa, stop. Yeah, Alexa keeps bothering me. Okay, uh, yeah, so image folders. Uh, so the Torch Vision has got image folders. What it does is if you guys would load your own data, and you can also uh, use the store example that we'll provide you. 
So inside uh, the MNIST folder, there is training and testing. And inside training, there are subfolders. Like in your case, the subfolders are uh, the classes the images uh, belong to. So suppose this is my zero face. So inside zero, we have images. What image folder does nothing. It sees that the data set that you have with you is in this format. So you have one folder and then you have subfolders. Inside the subfolders, you have images, okay? So what our data loader in this case would do is, let me go back, yeah. Why am I reloading the notebook? Unnecessary, but okay. So uh, I think there is a call to an image folder here. Yeah. So all you have to do in image folder is just call torch and data sets image folder, give the name of the path, boom, boom, boom. You have, uh, so what it will do is if you look at uh, the Kaggle data set properly, the image, uh, the folder numbers are not in zero, one, two, three, four. They are uh, something varying between zero to I think 9,700 or some range. What will do it, it'll get it into the range between zero to 4,000, which is basically where the image categories should map to in the output. Uh, is that clear? So, so you don't have all the numbers between zero and 9,000 necessarily inside your chain data. You only have 4,000 categories, which are basically some numbers that lie between zero to 9,700. So the image folder will basically map them to zero, one, two, just index them in order so that your network learns to output 4,000 categories. Is that clear? Yes, Shruti, can you check? Yeah, I don't think there are any questions on chat. Um, okay, cool. Um, so um, I will just uh, briefly go through the code. So now that you have all your images loaded and you have chosen your bat size, remember guys, shuffle equal to true during train, false during test. Um, choose your num workers according to the instance that you guys have got. Now let's talk about the restual block. I mentioned that there is a way where you can write. So if you have really deep networks, someone asked me that probably we you know, have to write all the layers one by one. That is of course an option, but in order to avoid that, what if, what if we want a simpler way? So see the model architecture right here. So what we are doing is our input image uh, uh, size, I mean, our input channel size is three since we have an RGB image that we have given you. And the output filter size we wanna have is 64. So we have 64 filters that we want to output from the input. So this is my initial layer, which will take the input and give me my 64 uh, channel output. Once that is done, now what I want to do is I want to add some residual blocks to the network because uh, it's a deep network and I don't want to have the trouble of working with vanishing gradients. I want to get great accuracy and test scores on Kaggle. So what should I do? And I don't want to write too much code too. So how do I do that smartly? Well. There is a way. So you see that there are these simple residual blocks that are added. These simple residual blocks, if you see the architecture inside them, like we had seen, uh, shown you in the presentation, have exact identical architectures. So this would be like the starting one where we had 64, 64, three, and there were two of them and we were repeating them three times. So you can just write them in one block, like a simple residual block. And you can keep calling this residual block again and again and again. Remember, remember, remember here, the feature map size was changing each time, right? So uh, you see this was 64, this was 128, this was 256, this was 512. This was differing and the number of times uh, the residual block was repeating was different for each case. So these are the only two things that you must change. Remaining, if you have convolutional networks created for you, only thing you have to do is repeat them again and again and again based on two things, how many times they will be repeated. What is the size of, or what is the depth of your feature map? How many filters do you want to have in each layer? Okay. And once you're done with one layer, then you're going to do a max pool, another layer, max pool, another layer, max pool. With layers, sorry, wrong word. When you're done with a block, then you will do max pool, another block, max pool, another block, max pool, and then average pool probably at the end. 
So this is uh, basically what is uh, happening right here when uh, you are creating a, a class called classification network. Inside that, you have this initial layer where you're passing the three uh, channels and you're getting the output of 64 channels. And then you have, you're recalling the residual block again and then again. You can also call this like inside a loop or something like that. Um, that you can find a way of doing that even more smartly instead of writing this again and again. So when we go to forward, what happens is X goes to this layer, then it goes to all these residual blocks one by one, and then uh, we have the final linear output. One thing you will notice that inside the residual block, there is an option of when stride is one, either you can do an identity layer, which is the skip connection we talked about, or you can further make the layers deeper. So uh, you have uh, the input to the residual block. And then in our case, what did we have? We had 64, 64, 3, again, 64, 64, 3. In that case, my shortcut would uh, either, uh, so in that case, you can stack like more layers inside this, which we have not done. We have just given you like a simple idea of how you should write your simple residual function. Once you're done with this, what I want to do is once I'm done with that block, I want to add that particular identity. So in order to uh, add or I, not identity, I would say a shortcut, yeah? So what kind of shortcut can you add will uh, depend. Why will it depend, guys? I will tell you why. Uh, because in, again, going back to the presentation, it would differ because the number of feature map sizes that differs and also your height and width differ. So suppose I'm finished with one block and you are moving on to the next block then I have to first do this uh, feature. Uh, I mean, so um, let me go to the architecture probably, yeah. So if you are done with one block and then this input has to go inside this block, then you see that there is a divide operation since we are dividing the feature map size. And also this uh, shortcut function would differ from uh, block to block, like once you're completing and you're moving from one block to another. So that is why there is this condition where uh, either you can send an identity in the case that your feature map, your height and width haven't changed, uh, that can be your shortcut. In the case that it has changed over the period of your deep network, you can do another convolution and add that convolution as your shortcut. And this shortcut, once you have passed X to that shortcut after passing it through the convolution layer, so you have a convolution layer, you have a shortcut added to it. Now you will concatenate both of them and send that out. And again, you repeat your residual block, another one, another one. And that's that's the architecture, guys. So um, now I think Shruti will talk about all the loss functions and uh, get more in depth uh, in detail with that. Thank you. So before I start, like, do you guys have any questions in Shadi's part that needs to be answered? Okay, so I think it's coming then. Let's start. Okay, so one question before I start. Um, I am giving you a classifier. I have an input X. I'm giving you a classifier which separates it into five classes. So can anyone tell me what exactly is the classifier learning? Like if you have two classes in the location, what exactly is my classifier learning? Any, any volunteers, any, anybody who want to answer? It's, I think it's learning the uh, like the hyperplanes that are separating the um, classes, separating the training um, examples into classes. Many okay. people say decision boundary on chat, clustering distance between interclass. Okay, yeah. So, so when I'm using a simple classifier and I'm using a simple cross entropy loss. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm just learning a decision plot. Is that 
have me okay i'm ju i'm just using a, dis a clear uh, like creating a decision boundary which could separate these classes right but not exactly uh, what i'm not learning is what i'm not accounting for is that whatever classes i have they should be closer to each other in the embedding space i'm just learning that these should be separable but i'm not learning that what should be the in intra uh, distance between these classes so uh, when when you do classification you are kind of like you don't need this information that much like it's it's fine like you make a decision boundary and you, or like you classify it it's completely fine but when you go into verification can anyone tell me what is the problem that we face like what why why this approach will not work i mean any wild guesses would be fine <laughs> i mean the classifier just knows that um, they are different but not by how much okay uh any more an unseen example could be so close to the decision boundary that it actually goes past it when it should be in like a cluster of um data that should be classified by another label but goes past the boundary and gets classified as something else right so i mean uh now when you are doing verification you don't like you just don't need that information that yeah my classes should be separate you need an information that yeah if i have like two images which are of same uh, representation i want them to to be represented in the same embedding space like they should be clustered together why because for example what banish said like if we have a, another example which is a new example we want our new example to match to that particular cluster to the cluster center of that class so what we are trying to do what we did in classification what we were trying to do in classification was this we were trying to identify a decision boundary which creates separable features but what we would do in verification is this we would also try to create like cluster all our similar images to one particular cluster so that these clusters would say that yeah this cluster is class 1 this cluster is class 2 right but do you think like your cross entropy loss is taking into account this information any wild guesses again would help no why not so uh basically your uh, cross entropy loss just tries to say that yes this class is uh belonging to a particular cl uh, particular cl class 1 and this class is not belonging to a particular cl a class 2 so what you do is by using like different kind of function uh, loss functions you try to account this particular information oh, very bad at annotating yeah so this this wow so yeah we are trying to uh, accommodate this particular um uh, this particular situation so people are clear on that that why we need this kind of uh, how the there is a shift between classification and verification any more questions on that uh somebody saying maybe svm classifiers can do that Yes, SVM classifiers can definitely do that. But the problem with SVM classifier would be that, for example, you have a class here and you have a class here. Your SVM classifier will try to maximize this region, but it doesn't take into account that all the classes here should be like you know also like minimizing the intra class with uh, distance as well. So it will try to maximize your boundary, but will not take into account this particular situation. The, is is that clear? I would like to counter Tushar. So Tushar, you're saying that it's a linear separator, but uh, SVMs do have something called kernel functions, right? Yeah, yeah, right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. So how do we do that? Like we have um, loss, center loss, which takes into account this particular 
situation where we want to minimize the distance between classes between the images of a particular class and we also min want to maximize the boundary between two classes so so when you see the center loss it's it kind of does this particular thing it's like a k-means clustering and it tries to minimize so this is your cluster center and for every class there is an assumed uh, an initialized cluster center where you try to minimize the distance between you try to learn that center and you try to minimize that that uh, that the distance between uh, the images of that particular class to that particular center and this particular loss function is is simply that will take into account how to separate those boundaries like try to maximize the boundaries between the different classes so this is how we do it and this particular loss is called center loss the output like the difference that you could observe here, how like what what difference that we see in the output is that when you use cross entropy, it's the situation is something like this. But when you use a softmax or like anything plus center loss, yes, your situation comes out to be like this. So for example, uh, if you have something like this, the representation of your vectors or the inputs in the embedding space to be like this. Whenever you want to see the similarity between two images, it's very pretty, like very easy to see it, right? But when you try to see the similarity between the images, it's very, since the classes are not like clustered together, it's not very easy to see. So this is one, yeah. So this is, uh, Yeah, so this is what center loss is, and this is how it takes into account uh, how to minimize the intra-class uh, class, uh, loss and how to maximize the inter-class loss, inter-class inter loss. Is that clear or do you have any questions? Shadi, is there any question on chat? Uh, none yet. So, yeah, so this was our center loss. And another type of loss is our triplet loss. So I would first go to the code of, uh, and I'll explain how center loss is implemented. And then I'll come back to the triplet loss and explain it and then go back there. So yeah. So this is in the recitation code. This is the cl uh, class that uh, is provided for implementation of center loss. And if you see here, what you do is that you take a cross entropy loss, which is your map, which is your loss, which is accounting for your intra interclass separation. And then you take a center loss, which is trying to minimize the interclass separation. And then you pass both these losses. So you create two optimizers optimizer label and optimizer C loss. This optimizer is uh, responsible for optimizing the, the separation between two classes. And this one is the discriminative separation between uh, among like within that same class. So this is what uh, the loss, uh, the optimizer and the losses look like. Now, what you do during your training loop is that yeah. So what, uh, so let's go back to this part of the code first. Yeah. So if you see here in the forward, what we are trying to do is that we, so something like, yeah. So whenever you have an input and you pass it to a network, And this is your supposed classifier. This particular input, which you find, which you pass to the final classifier, which is your final linear scoring layer, this is your embedding feature embedding. So what you're trying to do, so this particular feature embedding is the best representation of an input. So it's like rich feature representation of your input in the embedding space. So your center loss works on this embedding space. So what you do is that after you passed everything here, 
like through the residual blocks and all the layers, you take your um, the output of your uh, this whole particular layer, and then you pass it through a linear function. But this linear function is not the final linear scoring layer. This is basically transforming it into a feature dimension. So for example, you got something like 64 uh, features in your input. You want to transfer it to two. For example, two is your feature dimension. So you pass it into two. You then pass it through a, uh, a nonlinear activation. And then you pass this out, like you return it as a embedding output of your forward. Along with this, since you also want to separate uh, to like minimize the loss of in, uh, of uh, interclass separability. So in that case, you would also linear score your final output, and then you will also pass it, uh, like uh, return it as the output from your forward. Does that make sense? I am very bad at annotating, but sorry for that. But uh, is it making sense, this particular forward section? Guys, yeses, noes, please. I can see two yeses. A few yeses on chat. Okay, any questions? Would you please explain again? Uh, okay. You? Yeah. Yeah, so, so what I said was oh, that- okay. Can you zoom in a little, Shruti, is what they're asking. Okay. Is it fine? Yeah. Okay. So how, so how you take into this thing into account is that you have your input X, your, you have a classifier, suppose this is, your, uh, this is your CNN layer, and then you have your final linear fully connected layer, th which is your final linear scoring layer. And then this is your output, you may pass it to for changing it into probability, you can pass it to softmax. But then whatever you go, got from here, which is, which is like before the final linear scoring, uh, scoring layer, where, where you have like, for example, in your data, you have 20 classes. So you, you, you might be having like 4096 neurons in this particular layer and your output from your final fully connected layer, which is your scoring layer, turns out to be 4096 into 20. But this is not your feature embedding space. Your feature embedding space is one, one layer before that, which would be something, for example, some X dimension into 4096. So a layer, so the output of this layer would be your feature embedding. Is it making sense now? Uh, there's a question on chat. Mm -hmm. uh, do we need the embedding layer? Isn't the flattened output from the convolution already embeddings? So yeah, so this the the thing that you found that you got from the flattened output is your embedding, but uh, like this is your major feature representation. What I'm talking about is that the final linear scoring layer that you have, where you convert your feature to your to twenty classes, this layer is not your feature embedding. This is something, and this is something that you will like further process to make it more rich or compatible with the feature dimension that you're passing to your center loss. But like, is this making sense that whatever is the output of this layer is your feature, best feature representation of your image? Uh, yeah, but um, I understand it's the feature embedding, but um, what I don't understand is what is the extra thing you need to do with it now? Okay, so you're saying you, you're not clear about this part, right? Why we are doing uh, it. Yeah, like like after the regular uh, feature embedding thing, what do what extra thing we need to do now? After the regular, okay. So when you got your feature embedding, what you do is that you pass it to a linear layer. This is your linear layer, and this linear layer will like you. You will have a feature dimension. So this feature dimension you will pass in here. For example, in this case, your feature dimension is two. So you, what you do is you convert your whole um, embedding space to this particular feature dimension, and then you pass 
as a non-linear layer. This is not mandatory to do, but like having a linear layer is uh, something that is important. You can also try experimenting with the embedding layer, but for this case, I found that this is the best uh, case scenario for this particular architecture. So you can like either try experimenting directly working with this embedding or not passing the linear, but in that case, you might have to take care of the feature dimension that you pass uh, to the to the network. There's is a it, question by mm -hmm. Kate. Uh, the question is that why do we need an extra linear layer, which is the third last layer after the flattened output? So this one? Yep. Yeah, so this is basically you want to convert your whatever you got as the flattened uh, as the output of the flattened layer, you want to convert it into a feature dimension. This is a feature dimension that you pass in here as well. So you, you need to take into account. Yeah, so when you pass your center loss, when you create your initialize your center loss, you pass a feature dimension number to the center loss. So you should maintain that particular same feature dimension to, to the forward network that you have created. Is it making sense now? Uh, then my question is like, say mm -hmm. if we have the feature dimension same as the output of the flattened dimension, then do we need that extra, like, can we omit the extra linear dimension then? Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, then you don't need it. You just have to like maintain consistency with with this feature dimension and the feature dimension that you pass in as per your center loss. All right, that makes sense, thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah. Any more questions on this part? Because this part will help you reach a cutoff. <laughs> <laughs> so like, feel free to ask any questions that you have. Uh, are there any questions on chat? Shari? Uh, how do we know the number of feature dimension? Oh, that you have to like experiment with. Like, I mean, there is no particular rule for feature dimension. You can first, I, like how I would do it is that I would first try to keep my feature dimension to be same as what I got from the flattened output. If, if that doesn't work, then I might even change, like add an additional linear layer. Sorry, what is what is put exactly? What is? Uh, like the the line that says output equals self dot linear output embedding. So what exactly is that output? Oh, this one. So for example, no, the next line. The next line. Oh, this one. Yeah. Yeah. So this one is your final layer. So in in general classification, what you do is that you pass in your input. You pass it through a network, then you pass it to a fully connected layer. In the fully connected layer, you specify that what should be the output num like number of classes at the output. For example, my image has, for example, in our case, in this data for homework two part two, we have 4,000 classes, right? So your output layer, your whole embedding space should turn for this particular thing, should turn from, for example, it was 4096 in the embedding space, you you convert it to a 24,000 embedding space to pass it to a softmax to give you a probability of which class is the network predicting it to be. Is it making sense? This is like normal thing that you do when you pass, like you, you add a fully connected layer after your convolution layer to get the final output of your network. This so is, it is So yeah. it is the softmax? Is the linear output the softmax? No, it's just the linear layer. But here you have number of classes, number of output classes here. Uh, you are, I think, Shruti, uh, mm -hmm. below we are using the cross entropy function, right? Yeah. So the cross entropy function, the input to that, uh, so the cross entropy function does the softmax for you. So you don't yeah. have to pass it through an extra softmax layer after the linear at the end. Keep that in mind, guys. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this this is just giving you the logits that we call. So is are you guys clear on this? Shadi? Yeah, one person is saying yes. What about the rest? 
yeah now a lot more on chat not a lot but yeah <laughs> okay cool yeah it, it's making sense to a few people yeah <laughs> and like what about people <laughs> like how about the people who are not like understanding it i can explain it again if it's not clear yeah more more yeses <laughs> okay <laughs> cool so uh so right now we are clear that we so now we have like my final layer my forward will be passed will be giving like returning and embedding uh uh my feature embedding and then my final output if if you so this is a condition if you say that your return embedding is true so i think like explaining this would also help so this is the case of normal classification where you just use a uh, cross uh, entropy loss and then you just pass it like do the normal training that you have been doing in homework 1 homework 1 as well and then you pass it to your uh, criterion function the output the normal output that you get and uh, and the label but this particular center loss is a little different because you pass you you return your feature embedding as well as part of your forward and and then you like you take into so you, if you see here your um, model is returning um yes yeah so your model is returning feature embedding and your model is also returning the output so what you pass in as part of like what it, what you pass in for your soft max cross entropy loss is just your output but for center loss you pass the feature embedding and then what you do here is that you you add on both the loss functions and then you try to minimize that particular loss function so this this particular term is taking into account what is the intra class like minimizing the intra class separability within like Or for a class, and this is like interclass separability. Is it making sense now? Uh, Shruti, there was a question regarding two optimizers. I think I answered that incorrectly. How do we update the two optimizers? Mm -hmm. And there's a question on why uh, can we use like an activation function between the embeddings and the output? Yeah, we can use it. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, you can use any like any uh, so. it depends like if you use a, a non linear activation it might help it might not help as well for for most of the cases which i saw using a linear uh, linear layers between like non linear activation between the final two fully connected layers does not help that much but i mean you can use it it's like fair to use uh um, any more questions um no okay so now uh, you you since you had like two more uh, two optimizers you will like try to take a step in uh, like using both the optimizers and then you will like try to minimize your loss the whole loss this p loss weight is also a hyperparameter that needs to be tuned <clears throat> so yes so if you see uh, compare the performance of uh, your normal classification where you use just uh, cross entropy loss you got a validation accuracy at the ninth epoch to be 0.75 but the similar thing same scenario when you used for this particular case you got your accuracy to be turning out to be 91.20 so i mean this is a hint for your a cut off <laughs> <laughs> okay and then um yeah so apart from that um another thing that needs to be yeah i think that's it if you have any questions on center loss i can answer it now uh so I should i be waiting for the pseudo code to be released <laughs> okay now we have uh 
another loss, which is triplet loss. This in this, so there there might be cases in which like new new images could be added to your particular uh, training set or sorry testing set. So as like Shairi was mentioning before, that what like if you use the normal classification pipeline with a soft uh, with a cross entropy loss, what happens when you get an, another image which is like from entirely different class? How would your model handle that particular particular case? So that particular case uh, to handle that particular thing, you use a triplet loss where ra rather than you know like um, trying to minimize what like the the inter in, like intra class in sorry inter class differences, you try to see that like for any unseen examples, you will try to select a positive image, a negative image, and an anchor image. So like your anchor image would be same as your positive image, and negative image would be simply like completely different from that particular uh, positive image. And then what you try to do is that, I think this, uh, this would explain it, is that you, so if you see that in your learning, you try to minimize the difference between your anchor and the positive, and you try to maximize the, uh, the distance between your anchor and negative. So doing this, you could also handle cases where, so if you see this particular loss function or this type of training, you're not like relying on a particular class or on, on a particular training set. You're randomly taking examples of positive, negative, and anchor images, and you're training your network on that. So in case, for example, if you have you work in a company and you have like face IDs of everyone. And if there is another employee which gets added to your company, this would also handle that case, this particular loss, if you train your network on this particular setup. So triplet loss is used like that. And how do we do the training is summarized in this picture. So we have like a, we have parallel networks, but which, which are of the same architecture, but they have shared weights. So we, uh, train each network with like anchor image, positive image, and uh, negative image individually, but they are sharing weights. And then we try to minimize the triplet loss on that. And while testing, what we just simply do is that we pass the image, whatever network was learned, we will just take the, uh, the embedding or the output of that particular, uh, of that particular image. Is it making, do you have any questions on this? Uh, I don't think so. So uh, uh, why so must the anchor be the same class as the positive? Uh, why must the anchor be the same class as the positive? Yeah. Yeah, so what you're trying to say is that you have like a, diff, uh, a lot of, a lot many classes in your uh, training set and you're taking like any two uh, classes where you have like uh, the anchor should be like equal to your positive so what you're saying is that whatever I got I should like try to minimize these two classes uh, which are same and I'm tr I try I try to maximize any random uh, image that uh, random class that is not part of this class and try to maximize that uh, distance so something like this if you don't have an anchor image, like how would you minimize the distance between the positive class and the anchor image? So that's why these two has to be like uh, same. And this has to be, uh, the other one has to be different so that your network could generalize to any class that you take. And it could like, you know, maximize for any different class that was not taken as the part of test input. Okay, so the negative one is the, say, the new employee, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, any more questions on this? Shari? Uh, how is the anchor being chosen? Okay, so the, uh, the choice of anchor depends on the choice of positive image that you select. So it's like, um, I mean, it's random. Like for how you train it is that, for example, you have 10 classes in your training set. You randomly select two classes in your each iteration. And then out of those two classes, one class you select as positive and anchor and the other class you select 
as uh, the negative class. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we have given you, so you have to create a list on your own when you're training the network for the anchor, the positive and the negative. But like Shruti is mentioning again and again, during test, uh, you will have like an anchor selected and you'll have that non-trainable or uh, non-trained negative example that will come in and this loss will take care of that. So the anchor uh, have to be same class as the positive, right? Yeah. Yeah. So are we clear on triplet loss? <laughs> any, any, any no's, Shari? Not yet. <laughs> I can explain again. How do we build up the anchor during training? Yeah, so like you randomly select your positive class and then you take the your say you take your image to be as the same class as the uh, positive class so uh, how, i think uh, how i would say is that uh, so i have like image class 1 and class 2 and and then i have class 3 during my iteration uh, training, I would like um, select, for example, these two combinations, then I'll select these two combinations, and then I'll select these, these like whatever combination is left. Is it, is it clear now? So you mean it's an entirely uh, extra separate step from what we did before? Yes. So I this particular thing would be helpful when you when you would be do implementing a Siamese network, which is like you know um, the best network for verification. For this homework, you might or you might not need it, but like this this particular loss comes into picture for Siamese network. You can you guys can try this. So there are two kaggles. Mm -hmm. We have the classification kaggle for which uh, Shriti and I have walked you guys through. The loss functions you can use, the uh, models you can train. Uh, this is for the verification gaggle, which you can do based on the results uh, you have trained upon. So the classes that you have trained upon in the training set, you can take them and you have your verification lists. So you have your classes already built up. So the model knows uh, if, if you send two verification samples, it'll map them to an embedding space and it'll tell you whether they belong to a class folder or not. That way you can do the very, I mean, how similar those two images are that you're sending through the model and through the very, from the verification list. So that is a way we can do verification. Otherwise I'm gonna uh, talk a bit uh, in a bit about the Siamese network, which you can apply for separately for the verification Kaggle and you can use triplet losses and a few other losses I'll mention. Uh, in that method. So it can be done separately or it can be done together as well, both of the processes, if that's clear. So there's a question on chat, Shruti. How yeah. does uh, center loss improve the weights for the model? Aren't the gradients for the loss values solely being background towards center loss parameters? Uh, weights, uh, okay. So when you try to, okay, so it's same as uh, it's same as regularization. So I think I should like get back to the slide and that would be helpful. Um, yeah. So for example, consider this case when you use a regularizer. Imagine this case to be a regularization case. So you have one loss which which tries to maximize the interclass inter interclass separability, but one that that like you know maximizes your margin like that also gives your like stops your model from overfitting. So there is some kind, this similar type of analogy that we uh, do in here in center loss is that uh, we, we want our thing to like give a decision boundary which is maximally separable, but we also want the, the classes to cluster together, but nothing should be like, this is a hyperparameter. This Lambda is a hyperparameter that you have to tune so that you penalize your, uh, your this loss function to that levels that you're, you're like, you don't, to the point that you don't learn um, anything. Is, 
like you you just try to penalize this particular loss function as well like there there would be if this is incre increasing then this has to decrease or this is uh, increasing then this has to decrease if if you're trying to minimize this whole loss function it works same as like a regularization is it making sense yeah they say yes okay uh so after we are uh, done with this um so thankfully like you don't have to implement uh everything like a class implementation for central loss you have everything as part of our pytorch library so we have like triplet margin loss here there is one example that i've given is that you take like for example you take if you see here you take any particular example from your training data set and uh, you take three examples you make sure that your first two examples which is your anchor image and your uh, positive image belong to the same class which is 00, zero and negative image which is your some random class which is not the anchor or the positive and then you pass this these three images to your triplet loss and then you calculate the loss so this is the way how we use triplet loss, which is fairly easy. And uh, yeah, so this is what I have for center loss and triplet loss. If we have any questions, I can answer that here. Are there any questions, Sherry? Uh, no, not that I see on chat. Okay. So. So now we have like finally trained our network and we have got like a good performance. Uh, we have got a good accuracy, validation accuracy and train accuracy. Now, how would we uh, measure the performance, like the verification performance of our model? And like by verification, you try to estimate the similarity between two images. So, um, oh. so you have, you have two images, image one and image two, and then you want to uh, measure the similarity between these two images. Can anyone suggest me what could be the metric that I could use here? Anything? Any answer? Not on chat yet. Cosine similarity, somebody says. Okay. Uh, what about Euclidean distance? Can we use Euclidean distance here? So, uh, th so the reason that we don't use Euclidean distance here is that we have like our whole image, which is like belonging to a particular ang angular space and we try, so every every particular class is belonging to a particular cluster and they have a particular angular space. So we try to see that the angle between these two images belonging to the same cluster should be minimum, uh, should be minimum. And the uh, these, but the angular, I mean, sorry, if you take, uh, for example, if you take cos theta and, uh, cos zero should be like one. So you want your uh, similarity to be uh, tending towards one. And if the whole uh, uh, angular similarity between the cos theta value between two different classes should be tending to zero. That's what, that's how we try to measure the similarity between two images and how we do it, how we will do it in our case for homework to part two is that you just have, thankfully we just have PyTorch function which measure, measure similarity. And one example, particular use case for this is that I took a class which is zero uh, to, so my image A is class zero, my image B is again class zero, C is class one and uh, D is class nine. I passed this whole thing to my uh, network and if you see here, I, I set my return embedding to be true, which means that I want my embedding output from the network. And after I got my embedding output from the network, then I will try to see what is the similarity between the embeddings of, do, of 
So we took four images and we want to see what is the similarity between these two images. So we'll just apply the function compute similarity and see the similarity between the images. So if you see here for images which are like belonging to class zero and zero, we got a similarity score of 0.98. For our image which is belonging to zero and one, uh, class zero and one, we got a similarity score of 0.8086. Uh, and zero and nine, we got 0.8582. And the, the reason that we got a little bit more similar to nine could be seen in this image is that, see, the, these two images are belonging to the same class. So they are like giving the maximum similarity score. This and this also have like a like a uh, circle as common between these two images. So that's why your similarity score turned out to be 8582. And this is like completely different. So your similarity score is the least in this. So this is how you will measure your the, the verification performance of your model. How is your similarity score? Uh, are, are we clear on this? May I ask why the usual output wasn't returned only embedding? Yeah, so this is because your embedding space is the, the embedding that you get of your input when you pass it to the network is the best feature representation of your input. So that would be like representing your network into the latent space and it will convert the whole, like that could be the best possible representation of your input. And that's why we take the output of, of the embedding uh, layer. Like we take the embedding output. We don't do it for the output layer because what we have done is that if we, for example, in my, in my latent representation, I had 4096 dimensions of my uh, input. And when I pass it to a final linear scoring layer, I convert it into a 20 dimension uh, uh, feature representation, which would not be, you know, which would not be very informative in comparison to the 4096 dimensional space. So that's why we take that particular layer and pass it to the similarity matrix. Oh, so the network function is before you, you pass into the MLP, right? Uh, sorry? So I mean like the network function is the thing that is happening before you pass the uh, feature into the MLP. Uh, you don't, uh, you don't pass the feature to the NLP, you, you get like MLP, you get something like this is your network output that you get after the training your network. So uh, how would the cycle go is that like first you will train the entire network on the training images and then you will pick randomly two images and see if they are similar. So your network is already trained to capture the feature embedding of your inputs. And uh, you apply the next new image to the model. You get a feature uh, embedding of that particular new image. And then you check it with the other new image that how is the similarity like score? Is my model learning the feature, rich feature representation that it had to learn? So this is your uh, network output. Like what I'm doing here is I'm passing um, like a random test image and passing it to my trained network and getting the output, the embedding output of my test image. This is your testing uh, inference stage is what I'm referring to. Yeah, I guess my question is because remember previously um, there was one version where the output is the embedding and the output. So there are two outputs, but now there is only one. So, so that's why I'm asking, is it because okay. the function is written differently? So there are only one output here. Oh, I get your point. So right, so if you see here, I've done an indexing of zero. So it the network was supposed to return two output, but I only, since my first output is the feature uh, embedding. So I just took the zero with output. Oh, I see, thank you. Okay, any more questions? I think Shruti, we'll wrap up in 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, uh, I that's all from my side. If we have any questions I can take, um, otherwise. Yeah. Good to go. Uh, somebody says that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> I think some people slept off from 66. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Uh, guys, just holding you on for 10 more minutes, real quick. Um, okay. Yeah, so let's uh, quickly talk about the verification task. Till now, what have we talked about? We have talked about the classification task. The classification task where you'll have those image folders uh, where uh, the image folders represent which face we are referring to and uh, many sub images in those uh, folders to basically uh, get the network a sense of how a particular face should look like. So like we told, uh, like I had mentioned, like absolutely in the starting, this is like that closed set problem that you have. But in order to generalize better, and like Shruti had mentioned using triplet loss, there is something called network training using uh, Siamese networks. Now, Siamese networks, I mean like, okay, uh, there's nothing different that's happening here much except for the outcome that we want in the network. So this is again, if you guys have like listened through, this is again your model architecture. In this case, it would be anything but like, or like we had probably mentioned ResNet. So what, what do we do usually? Usually we pass one image at a time and uh, we train the network and we send like multiple images at a time and something like that. Here, what we would do is if you guys have checked your verification lists, the verification valid list and the verification test list, in the verification valid list, um, we have a pair of images uh, where the third uh, point in that uh, particular TXT file you'll see is a zero or one. One means that the pair of images are similar, zero means that they are dissimilar. What we are doing is, what we want to do right now directly, we will take the two images from the verification list that we have, and we will pass image one through our ResNet. We will pass our image two through our ResNet. And then like Shruti mentioned, we will get the embedding. Remember this embedding is the second last layer which is like a high dimensional better and the best feature representation for uh, the model, like whatever the model has learned through the network. So this is the second last layer. So we have embedding one with us, let's call it E1. Then we have embedding two with us. And just like Shruti mentioned again, just use some distance metric, something like a cosine similarity and see how close or further together those two images are. So here the network is directly learning whether the images are similar or whether the images are dissimilar, which is the main motivation of doing face verification, right? So if you have like a biometric video and a new face comes in and there was an old face, uh, so you basically want to compare if it's the same person or somebody's proxying or things like that. So it is absolutely the same. The whole code that we have given you, everything is the same. You don't have to use a center loss if you're directly training with a verification model, then you can use a cross entropy loss, but I will shortly discuss something called a contrastive loss. If you're directly training with a pair of images and seeing that whether they're similar, whether they're dissimilar, the idea remains the same that whenever we project the images to an embedding space, we want the similar images to be close together, the similar images to be as further as possible. When we are not training with what we had got from the classification set, then we have to swipe, uh, slightly tweak uh, this a little, uh, the loss function especially. Uh, what do we do? Let's have a look quickly. I will clear the drawing, okay. Yeah, we use something which is uh, called a uh, contrastive loss function. A contrastive loss function, like it's mentioned in this slide, it is basically a metric learning function. You are directly learning how to train with the verification pairs instead of creating, uh, instead of making the model learn certain uh, classes specifically so that when an outlier class comes, the model is surprised, oh, I have never seen this face before. Where should I put it? 
confusion is not, not something that we want when uh, we are doing this task, right? So, uh, so let's have a real quick look at the loss function. So here uh, you have two sections in the loss function. This is the first portion, this is the second portion. Y stands for whether the images are similar or dissimilar, which you, the label that you have in that verification list that you guys will see in the validation set. So that'll tell us whether the two images that are passed are similar or not. X1 and X2 are the images that have been passed and DW, there, there's a term called DW. What is DW? DW is basically the difference in between the outputs that you get when you pass uh, X1 through the model and X2 the, through the model. So here the model is basically being termed as the G function. So we want to find the difference between them. Here uh, they have just done the uh, L norm. You can use cosine similarity, other metrics like that to find the distance in the latent space in between the embeddings of image one and image two. Once you do that, let's consider the case when the images are similar. When the images are similar, then, so here you see, then our y is equal to zero. When our y is equal to zero, then this, this portion will get negated off and we are working on this portion of the loss function. So here our loss function is only penalized with the L2 norm of the difference in between the embeddings of the two images. What if in the case that the images are dissimilar? In the case that the images are dissimilar, we are using this very weird function. So before I confuse you guys even more, let's have a look at what we are trying to achieve using contrastive loss so that we can understand this loss function much better. So let's do that real quick. So. Yeah, a lot of content on this slide, sorry guys, but just bear with me for five more minutes. Yeah, what do we want to do? Like we have mentioned throughout the bootcamp, if, if this is, if this is uh, my particular class and these, these classes, these are similar to this, this class, what we want to do is we want to bind these together as close as possible. And if these white dots that we have are dissimilar, then we want these to move away. We want the whites to move away even further. Exactly what we want to achieve is this, right? Similar points closer together, dissimilar points further away as much as possible. So in order to do that, particularly, we introduce the concept of something called a margin, just like we had in SVMs. We consider a concept called margins. So here in the loss function, if you have, guys have seen in the previous slide, we had uh, this term called M, which is mentioned. So M is nothing but the margin. What happens is, um, so what you want to do is you create a margin or, uh, around the particular, uh, so let's say we have two images, okay? So let's consider that this is embedding for image one. And let's consider that this is our image two. What we want to do is we want these embeddings to be close together. So we want I2 to come inside this margin. So this is what we want. This is I2 and this was our I1. So now they are close together. What we, in the case when they are dissimilar, so your Y is equal to one and your verification list has that one, what you want to do is you don't want this. You want to put it outside the margin is exactly what we are doing here. So if you guys look at the loss function carefully, I will clear the drawings. Yeah. So if you guys see the loss function carefully, if uh, let's say your DW, which is the difference between the two is greater than the margin. So this is your margin and these are two similar points and this is that dissimilar point and say this is your margin M. So if the distance between these two points is greater than the margin, then we do not penalize the loss because already, uh, so sorry, let's say this is the dissimilar point, right? Because when the point is dissimilar, then only Y is equal to one. So let's consider if this is 
beyond the margin, then already that dissimilar embedding is far enough. We don't want to penalize the loss function to push it further away. But in the case that this dissimilar point was inside the margin, then that's too close to our embedding space can totally confuse our model. So we want to push it out. In that case, what will happen if this is inside, then this term will become positive, right? So we will penalize the loss with respect to this term now and not the zero portion, which would have been the case if it was already, the dissimilar point was already pushed out of the margin. Uh, is everybody kind of clear with that? Any questions? Uh, what is G? Uh, G is the function. So the G is nothing but uh, like you do model comma X, right? This is what is G, clear? This, this I've just represented as a function. It's easier to do that on the slide, right? So, uh, so your G is your ResNet or anything that you're passing your X through to get the uh, embeddings. Is that clear? Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I have one more question. What is the subscript to there? Sorry, sorry. What is the subscript to um, outside the um, G absolute sign, absolute value sign? What's the subscript to there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, probably I think there's a typo. This is basically when you're finding the L2 norm that you like mentioned that subscript, I think if I'm not wrong. Yeah, the L2 norm. So that is why you mentioned the subscript here. So this is basically the square of like whatever you get from G minus X2. I guess I'm moving out of the screen gradually. So yeah. Is that more understandable for you? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Whatever works. Cool. Uh, you can also use not this, but you can just pass them through NN cosine GX1, comma GX2. That would also give you a score. Yay, cheers. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the basic concept and uh, any more questions? And there are other types of losses as well, which you are free to read the research papers from. Uh, yeah, uh, that's about it. I will just uh, quickly just uh, summarize uh, the classification and the verification tasks uh, before all of you guys leave. Um, so, Yeah, so in the case of when we are directly doing verification, which is the Siamese network, you will have image one, you will have image two from your verification list. You will pass it to the black box, which I'm calling my network. And you will take the second last layer and you will get the embeddings you will compare these two using loss functions like contrastive, or you can try your cross entropy as well and check what the model performance is if you want. And finally, your model will basically get trained on whether the images are similar and dissimilar. Basically, we'll have the margin where all we want is if these are there, then these distances are smaller. And if this point is dissimilar, then these distances are as far as possible. Something like that is what you're trying to do here. Since you have the verification task, that's why you would want to use something like a contrastive loss. And uh, everything else remains the same. The model architecture, the image loading, the training of the network just takes one, uh, two images, one after the other, and then compares it using uh, cosine similarity. And uh, one last thing was the classification task where you have many subfolders 
So this is phase one, phase two, phase three. They have many images inside these. Each of them just get the idea. And once you have this, then uh, you will take one image at a time, all the images, and then you will pass through the network. And what will the network learn? The network will learn that image one looked like some embedding image, uh, not image, sorry, face, face one. Let's say this is face one. This is of class. Let's say this is this class. And then there is phase two, which, which belongs to probably this class. And then you will take these embeddings, compute a cosine or Euclidean, try both, and use, like Shruti mentioned, the center loss if you're looking for the A cutoffs. And uh, finally, you can get the AUC score. And voila, you guys are done. I hope, uh, yeah, I hope now you guys are good to go and hopefully uh, submitted by the submission deadline. Shruti, any parting words for everyone? No, I think like if they have like any questions, any logistical questions, if you have, how should we load the test set? The testing directory has a different structure than training. So I think image folder wouldn't work. Yeah, so in that case, you might have to create your own test data set class to load uh, images for test and handle that case. There is like uh, in the notebook that we would be sharing, uh, we have both the options of using image folder and like parsing the list of files. So you could like have a reference there and use it, something similar. Uh, I remember in the rest net, um, you have one version where when the stride is not one, uh, you do not use the identity function for the shortcut. Instead, you use another uh, another thing. And I just wonder, like, uh, if that's the case, then it would, because originally the identity function's function is to say, okay, it's not learning anything anyway, so let's uh, make the input the same as the output. If the shortcut is not the identity function, this um, this uh, important property interrupt you quickly. So uh, the identity function is basically like you got placeholders, right? It's an identity placeholder. So in the case that uh, so you you take the skip connection, uh, so you take the input layer, you pass it through deeper layers, and then suddenly at the end of that de deep layer you have convolved over. So maybe your height and width have changed. Maybe your depth has changed. Now, what do you want to do? You want to take uh, a few layers back from that point that have reached. Uh, and you want, uh, let's say we had three layers, right? So we had an input, we had three deep layers. And at the end of the three deep layers, you want to again pass the input in after the third layer. In order to do that, you have to check if the channel dimensions are the same because you are at the end of the day concatenating. So your height and width and uh, channel dimensions would probably differ, which is why it probably might not be an identity anymore. Then it would be another convolution that you have to pass X through and uh, so that uh, you get that skip connection. Uh, you can uh, probably take the data, uh, like the example that we have given and print out the shapes and see exactly why this is happening. Okay, thank you. Um, so there are two more questions on uh, the chat. One is, can center loss hurt the performance of the classification part? Uh, I think like center loss would be better if you use it in verification Kaggle. Um, how I would approach it is like, I would first try to uh, train my network on classification task with normal cross entropy loss and see what my performance is doing a hyperparameter tuning if that works. And for verif verification, I would use a center loss. Uh, Wiccan Wang, did I answer your questions? Question? Okay. Yes, yeah, so um, like mm -hmm. I, I already did um, I guess part two, but like I do see overfitting um, a lot with ResNet. So I'm just wondering if we use this center loss as um, regularization, does it actually help um, to help the model generalize better or? Uh, yes, I think it would help uh, to generalize better. 
even for the classification part? Yes, I think so. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, another question is from Xiang Liu. In the triplet laws, do we maximize the distance between the negative and every single existing class? Maximize the distance between negative? Yes, right. Um, do you have any more questions on that, Zian? Okay. So I think that's it that we have, that's all the questions that we have on chat. Yeah, and we will be uh, posting the slides and the notebook with you guys shortly. Yeah. Sorry for keeping you awake for, <laughs> it's around 12 <laughs> Anyway, all the best, guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. I think Shruti will stop the recording. Okay.